In today's show, we're looking at injuries around the NBA. What do we need to be careful of heading into next season? Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Officially, this is the deadest part of the season, I think. Yeah, maybe you could say the end of April, but we're doing a lot of season review stuff, sort of working out what happened, the playoffs are on. There's nothing happening. The draft is done. Summer League is over. There's unsigned free agents like PJ Washington, Kelly Oubre, Christian Wood, who might have an impact on teams, but that no one's signed. We've got trades waiting with Damian Lillard and James Harden, perhaps, most likely moving teams, but nothing's happening. We can't, Yahoo has an open for the next season, so we don't have their rankings or ADP data. ESPNs are up, but we all know that it's very hard to rely upon what's happening over there. So it's a dead period. Next week, I am starting individual team preview shows. They're a good way, again, to get baseline. We talk to the t- players, the players, not the players, maybe the players, not the players. We talk to the people covering the teams about what they expect from the squad, any little bits of inside information that they might have, just to sort of lead us into the season. And then we'll be interspersing fantasy things throughout that run of 30 shows over the next couple of weeks. Yesterday, we had a dynasty mock draft with Matt Lawson. We went 300 players deep. Probably should have gone deeper. Go check out that mock draft. I will have redraft mock drafts coming. Oh, there's going to be tons of them. We're going to have those coming, um, but not until we really start to get... I've got to finish projections first. But also until we get into, yeah, probably the middle of August, we'll do our first one of those and run from there with some mock drafts all the way leading up to the start of the season, October 24th. A couple of other things that I'm working on. I'm working on, and I think I'm there with it. I'm not sure. I'm working on a dynasty ranking formula. It's been a long time coming and I'm still not sure that I'm 100% there. But part of the reason that I have in the past not really put out Here's my Dynasty startup rankings. A is that Dynasty is really hard to do in terms of overall ranks because there's different ways to approach everything. Rebuilding, contending, where you're looking at age, that sort of stuff. And when I do projections, they're not, I'm going to pull a um, ranking out of my ass and put a guy there. It's all based on projections and individual statistics. I think, I'm not 100% sure on it, but I think... I am getting close to unveiling something I'm going to be calling the dynasty factor, um, which is a number that we derive that we can add on to individual projections each season that will hopefully give us an idea of where the players rank in dynasty. It's not going to be an exact science, of course, but I am working on that. The second thing I'm working on is, you know that I always like to tweak rankings because I think the individual nine cat rankings that get put out on certain sites where it's just straight Z score numbers, I think that they're misleading and I think that they are wrong. And I have uncovered something which I think will shake things up. I can't say too much more on it because I don't want to get people's hopes up because it might not actually work out. Um, It might not be possible to do, but I do think that I have found a way to rank players which is more accurate and more useful. Now, it almost definitely won't be universally taken up by people and you still get those old ranking numbers, but... I have a lot of things going on in my head and with lots of spreadsheets going on at the moment where I am trying to figure out and I think I have found some sizable enough holes in ranking formulas that does skew some of our belief of players and the way we build fantasy teams that if this does work out, I I don't want to sound like it's too important, but I think it would be relatively game-changing. I hope it works out. A lot of testing to be done on it. But they're the two things I'm working at. My new form, my new rankings formula and my dynasty factor. Yeah, dynasty factor. That's what I'm going to call it. Now, that's five minutes of waffling. 
I don't normally waffle that much to start off a show, but again, there's nothing happening. So I just thought I'd give you an update on things that are going on. What I'm going to do over the next two shows is injury updates across the league. We're going to start with the Eastern Conference and talk about players. And things will crop up once we hit our media day in the beginning of training camp, which is usually the end of September, around the 20th of September usually. So we're six, seven weeks away from that. We'll get injury news cropping up. But these are the things that we need to watch for now. The situations that we have some concern over about players entering the season injured. Warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right, so we will head to Washington first. We are doing the Eastern Conference. Two players there that missed significant chunks, if not all of last season, that we do need to pay attention to. One of those is the Italian cock, Danilo Gallinari. Hands off my cock! Who tore his ACL before he even... He tore it at Eurobasket, which happened around September last season. He is ready to go. So he signed with Boston and never played. And now he is in Washington. I have no idea how he is going to fit into this Wizards rotation. Probably probably as Kuzma's backup. But then there's Avdia. Oh, man, that rotation is weird. But Gallinari is not likely to be a standard league guy. But someone that we can stream in when we need some points and some threes. He's going to miss time. He's going to be on limited minutes. He's going to sit back to back, so I would guess. And he probably have fake injuries towards the end of the season. If he is, in fact, providing positive value, which he may or may not be. Fake, 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 fake. The other one is Ryan Rollins, someone that I did draft yesterday in that Dynasty mock draft really late. He played about 10 games last season and suffered a broken foot. And he was a guy that at the top of the second round of the 2022 draft, I did like quite a bit. He was really buried for the Warriors, but now he heads to a Wizards team where in the future there are openings. Yes, Tyus Jones is probably the starting point guard. DeLon Wright is there as the backup. They also have Landry Shamet, but let's be fair. DeLon Wright's 30 years of age. Landry Shamet's bad. These are not guys they are relying upon to carry them through. And I am not saying that Ryan Rollins is their point guard of the future. Don't know. I think he can be an interesting rotation player. And when he does get minutes, especially in April, when the season becomes a uh, you know, shit show for bad teams like the Wizards, Rollins is a very, very interesting player. And at least we get to see him in a somewhat larger role this season. Hopefully. Hopefully that's how it works out. Toronto Raptors. The only guy currently who I have any concerns about injury-wise is Otto Porter Jr., who played about two games last season. That's not entirely accurate, but for our purposes, it's close enough. Porter signed after playing the season before for the Warriors, moved to Toronto because his wife was from Toronto, and then went ahead and played eight games and 18 minutes a night with a foot issue again. Porter has only just turned 30. It feels like he's 100 years old. He's only just turned 30. And if he is healthy, that adds another name to the mix of Chris Boucher, Thad Young, Precious Achua, Jalen McDaniels. Just another five, six foot nine forward slash centers off the bench. Porter is not going to be a fantasy guy, really, at all. But another name that's there that can play minutes and impact the value of a lot of different bench guys for deeper formats. We did get news today, though, of an injury, and that is the table. Montrez Harrell tearing his ACL and meniscus, and that is done. That's season over for Montrez Harrell, who opted out of his player option. The Sixers brought him back, and we go, what are the Sixers doing? Why are there five centers on this roster? Embiid, Paul Reed, who they brought back, Mo Bamba, who they brought in, Montrez Harrell, who they re-signed, and Philip Petrosev, who they signed. Well, they're down to four centers now. And I still think that Reed is the primary backup, and there'll be some nights where Bamba gets a minutes. But we'll see how Nurse likes to run that. I don't know. Nurse has no problem running a smaller center, which is Paul Reed. But Harrell is out of that mix. I think that might be the end of Harrell's NBA career. He was already teetering. He was already bad. And now he's torn an ACL and he's over 30. So yeah, Harrell is out of there. I don't think he was going to be a part of the rotation anyway. But even if he was, well, he's not going to be now. Today's episode is brought to you by Ibotta. You pick up burgers or hot dogs for a summer barbecue. Hot dogs, to me, are not something that go on a barbecue, but according to a bottle, they are. But I know you guys in America would put a hot dog on a barbecue. I don't know. We just we do hot dogs differently. Sausages on the barbecue? Sure. Go pick them up. That's not the point of this ad. Well, you're picking those things up, so why don't you get cash back for it? And you can do that with Ibotta. It is officially summer for you guys, and a new season means new clothes. But your closet shouldn't be the only thing 
that is growing when you're making these purchases. You can do that with cash back with Ibotta. Food, clothing, whatever it is, Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items or clothing items or whatever it is that you are purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $120 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip or a flight to go visit relatives that maybe you should go see more often or a nice fancy dinner. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners five bucks just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKED when you register. That's $5 for free. $5 might not, might not seem like much, but they're literally saying, have $5. Have it for free. That's all you need to do. Go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCKED. It says here that LOCKED is in lowercase, so just be careful of that. Even the L is lowercase. It doesn't specify that it needs to be lowercase, but they've deliberately written it in lowercase, so I'm telling you that. That's Ibotta. I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or the App Store and use the code LOCKED. Again, it's all lower case. Oh, yeah. It's time. It's time. You're going to be absolutely stunned, flabbergasted, shocked, appalled that clothing mogul Apparel legend, Jonathan Isaac, is injured. He ended last season after playing 11 games, tearing his adductor and having surgery on it. That goes back to the ACL injury that he had, which then led into a hamstring injury. And then he came back, which took three years to return from. For what reason, I have no idea. Came back, played no minutes, and played like 120 minutes for the season. And tore his groin. And he should be ready for the start of the season. He has a very, very, very lightly guaranteed contract. I do not have any idea how the Magic view him, but I would be very confident in suggesting that he is not in their plans ahead of Franz Wagner or Paolo Banquero. Um, Could he play a 16 to 18 minute a night roll off the bench in the 40 games that he rolls out there? Sure. Should we care for fantasy? No. Now, I know that there are going to be plenty of Jonathan Isaac truthers out there. I fought with you guys all of last season who were telling me he was such a great ad off the waiver wire. Cool. If you want to add him or draft him with your last pick in a draft, because in 18 minutes a night, he can get a steal and a block, that, that's probably true. And if someone gets hurt, maybe he plays more minutes, but let's be fair, the odds of him getting hurt are significantly higher than the odds of Franz Wagner or Paulo Banquero getting hurt long-term, although luck is a part of that. So Isaac should be ready to begin the season, but I have I have to be really careful in saying that because, again, the man took three years to return from a nine-month injury or an 11-month injury. So how can I tell you that he should be ready for the start of the season? He should be, but should ain't got nothing to do with it with Isaac and injury returns. So let's just assume that he's going to miss a bunch of time. We have a slight hope that he's ready for training camp or is he going to be devoting time to creating anti-woke clothing? We will find out. The New York Knickerbockers, here is where things get a little more serious. Julius Randle sprained his ankle towards the end of the regular season, came back in the playoffs, seemed to hurt it again, and played through it. Let's be fair, played bad. He wasn't very good in the playoffs at all. Is that ankle related? It very well could be. And I have an ongoing theory, which I've never really fully tested out, is that when players sprain their ankle, and it's fairly significant, they always come back too early. Now, in the NBA, players, despite what you may have been told by a lot of media outlets, players actually come back from injuries too early in the NBA, all the time. Hamstring injury should be 20 days. They come back in four, seven. No wonder they ping them all the time. They come back too early. And players with ankle injuries, they often come back too early, and then it impacts their play for the remainder of the season. I've seen this many times with Tobias Harris, Ricky Rubio, Jimmy Butler. Uh, I think it happened to Ja Morant as well. So when they come back, they're just not the same. No confidence in their movement, no confidence in their lift, their shooting percentage drops, and Randall sucked in the playoffs. With, is that because he came back too early from the ankle injury? Maybe. And then, after the playoffs ended, he went and had surgery. So yeah, it was a bad ankle injury. Now, that time off from when he had it in May, the surgery, uh, or was it June? Regardless, through to October, he'll be fine. I think. He has had some ankle problems in the past. I don't think this is going to be something that lingers, but someone coming in off a surgery, there's always a chance that it does cost him a little bit of time at the beginning of the season. That is possible. 
So just be aware of that when valuing valuing your Knicks guys, especially if you're doing drafts before training camp starts, that Julius Randle had ankle surgery. That might also impact his conditioning. Did he start off the season slow? All of that is a factor. The other two guys on the injury report are Dylan Windler, who signed a two-way. He's had foot issues forever. I don't think he even played a single game last season for the Cavs because of that foot. He's now on a two-way there. I don't expect much from him. And the other one is Emmanuel Quickly, who did hurt his ankle also in the playoffs, and I think didn't play the final three games of that series against the Heat. That is not something that I think there's any lingering impact from, not like the Randall one where he had to have surgery, but it is just a quick reminder that Quickly didn't mean for that quick pun in there or quick alliteration. Not even alliteration. I just said quick two times. I didn't. Uh, I don't think that Quickly ankle injury is something that's important for us. The more important factor on Quickly's value is the addition of Dante DiVincenzo. But he did miss those last couple of games of the season. Here's another one that is important. In fact, two that are really important. Giannis and Tomatou. Giannis is not going to play in the World Cup, I believe. And we have talked about this for probably at least three years. That Giannis's knee is rooted. I'm going to be talking with Kane Pittman at some point for the Bucks preview in the next couple of weeks, and we'll talk about this. But Kane told us this a few years ago, that Giannis has a long-term knee injury that is always going to keep his games played down, and he will have plenty of maintenance days. And I believe that Giannis has undergone a small cleanup surgery on his knee again after he missed time last season. And we saw big declines from Giannis. Forget the free throw percentage. That doesn't matter for fantasy. Well, it does, but it doesn't in Giannis's case because you know that if you draft Giannis, you're losing free throw percentage. That's just how it is. It's like if you drafted Shaq back in the day. So if he shoots 30% or if he shoots 60%, it doesn't actually really matter. Maybe in some roto leagues, there's a slight difference. But in head-to-head as a general rule, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that Giannis' steals and block numbers dropped. And his scoring went way up. His usage went up, which is interesting. But the defensive numbers dropping, is that a preservation thing on his knee? Well, I can go hard because of my knee, but I, can, I can't go as hard defensively. That's somewhat of a worry for where he sits. Now, the decline of Giannis's value last season is significantly overstated. But I am a little worried that this ongoing knee problem, another knee surgery, he's going to miss games this season. He's going to miss games, whether through back-to-back rest, the knee, he's going to miss games. Um, and then do the block and steal numbers return? We've also got a new coach there, Adrian Griffin. We'll see how that all works out. The other one is Chris Middleton, who had a disaster of a season. Had a knee injury in the 2022 playoffs and then had wrist surgery in the offseason, which we thought he would be back from about two weeks into the regular season. Took about six for him to come back. And then when he came back, his wrist was okay. And then his knee was a problem again. And they just managed him through this knee thing. He was out for about a month with like knee soreness and then he had limited minutes and they eventually ramped him back up. He started to look okay towards the end of the season. But then another knee surgery. And like Middleton had knee problems back in college. Like Giannis, this is feeling like it is a long-term thing. Like it is not a you tore your ACL at age 24 and you're okay. This feels like it is going to be an ongoing issue where there's always a little bit of trouble with Middleton's knee, where you're going to be in a situation where he sits some back-to-backs and he probably never touches 70 games again. So both Middleton and Giannis coming into the season with knee injuries, even though we expect Middleton to take gigantic steps forward from his overall rank numbers of last season, there is still that absolute concern there. And there's no way that I'm looking at him as a top 45 player with that knee injury persisting. For Miami, we're in a pretty good spot. Jaime Jaquez had that shoulder problem, which caused him to miss most of Summer League outside of the first game in a bit. I don't think there's any worry about that carrying over. And who knows if he even plays for this team. Other guys who are injury prone on that team, like Tyler Hero with the hand problem, who is fine and ready to go, or Kyle Lowry with his myriad of issues, or Jimmy Butler with his toe and back and knee and whatever, they're all currently healthy. That doesn't mean they're going to stay healthy, but they're all currently healthy for the Miami Heat, whose big question is, who the hell is even on this team? For the Indiana Pacers, if you look at their injury report at the end of last season, everyone was out. Tyrese Halliburton was out, Buddy Heald missed the game with an illness, I think, there. Miles Turner was out, Isaiah Jackson was out, TJ McConnell was out. They were just tanking. That's that's it. None of those injuries are an issue. But there was a surgery to Jarris Walker after uh, Summer League. Hello. 
had a surgery on his elbow after he shot approximately 12% from three. Was that impacting his shooting? I, I suppose that's a possibility. It doesn't appear like it's going to be something that bothers him heading into the season, but losing two months or so of of uh, practice time, of acclimatization to an NBA environment, maybe he misses some of training camp. I, I'm not really sure. That would lean me to believe that Obi Toppin is in the driver's seat to be the starting power forward for the Pacers, meaning that Walker's a reserve, who I do think it shouldn't take too long for him to overtake Toppin, but... The thing with that is Toppin's skill set next to Miles Turner and next to Tyrese Halliburton is amazing. I think that that is the perfect, and I don't like Obi Toppin necessarily as a player, but I think the fit next to Turner and Halliburton, you could not pair him with two better options. Whereas Jarris' inability to shoot, and he's not as much of a, a, a transition lob threat the way that the way that Obi is, um, that I yeah, look, that would definitely to me at the beginning of the season, I think that Rick Carlo will come in thinking. Obi is going to have first crack at it, and Jarris probably takes over, but it is a good situation. So just remember that. That was a long, long-winded explanation. Let's go to the Detroit Pistons. My name is Richie Cunningham. Yeah, Cade missed all but 11 games last season with that stress reaction in his leg. Had surgery, probably honestly could have played at some point through it or come back if they were a team that was serious, but they weren't. But now he's back. He's fully healthy. He's ready to go. There's, there is risk of that sort of thing recurring, I guess. But from my memory, the two players of note who have had those similar sort of problems in the NBA are Bradley Beal and Drew Holiday. And neither of them have, have had any recurrence of them in like 10 years. And the understanding I had is that Cade probably could have played through some of the stress stuff, but it wouldn't have gotten better. And having the surgery is a gigantically high chance of fixing the problem permanently. So, while Cade had some real struggles with his shot early last season, when you look at an 11-game sample where he shot 29%, that doesn't tell you that Cade Cunningham's a 29% shooter. He had an 11-game sample of averaging 0.8 steals. That doesn't tell you that he's a bad steals, bad field goal, bad three-point guy. Because he averaged like 1.3 steals or whatever as a rookie and 31% from three. So I'm expecting that Cade, I haven't seen any ADP data. I'm expecting that Cade falls pretty significantly in drafts because of last season and because of people's skepticism. And I, the reason I say people's skepticism is I get into arguments, not necessarily arguments, but I see people push back on me. Man, you can't take Cade. He's always injured. You can't take Cade. He's a terrible shooter. He gets no stocks. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. doesn't do this. Well, I think the guy averaged 25 and a half and six and a half in those 11 games last season and put on a stretch run that was a top 30 run at the end of his rookie season as well. Um, if he's falling outside the top 50, and, and I don't know that he is, but if he is, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about it. I think that he is fully healthy. We'll, we'll talk to Kuki Hill of Locked On Pistons to see if there's any more information, but I think we're okay with that. Any other fake injuries they had, like Boyan Bogdanovich and Isaiah Stewart at the end of last season were just exactly that. They were, they were fake. Fake, 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 fake. The Cleveland Cavaliers, there's nobody currently on the injury report. W. Huge W. Hope it stays that way. Not quite as positive for the Chicago Bulls, where Lonzo Ball is going to miss the season. And most likely, his career is over, which is just dreadful. Obviously, a fantastic fantasy player. Obviously, a guy that is just an amazingly impactful NBA player. But the knee problem, it's been since January 22 that that knee problem really started, has not played since, and will not play this season. We already know that, though. We saw that last season where Odesuma was the starter for a bit, then Alex Caruso took over. And now they add Javon Carter into that mix. The other one is Justin Lewis, who they signed to a two-way at the start of last season. He had a torn ACL. He didn't play. He's back this season again uh, on a two-way. Lewis was an interesting undrafted guy from the 2022 draft. I don't think he's going to do anything on this team. And I think Adama Sonogo is the best two-way guy currently on that team. Their other guy, I don't really know why they signed him. I can't remember. Uh, 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 Oralup? I, I cannot remember that guy's name. Um, let me have a look. What is what is old mate's name for the Bulls? The third two-way they signed after they let Javon uh, Freeman Liberty uh, move up to Toronto, which they should not have done. Javon? Is that, that's the right name. God, I'm just struggling with names here. Who is the other guy? Uh, Honoralp Bitim. Shout out to all my Turkish listeners. Let's go to the 
uh, Hornets, where they had some actual injuries and some fake ones down the stretch. There was fake injuries for Haywood and PJ Washington and Terry Rogier, but there were some real injuries as well. Lamelo Ball sprained his ankle, came back, sprained his ankle, came back, fractured his ankle. Does that mean Lamelo Ball is going to injure his ankle every single season? No. He came back too early from the first ankle sprain, stepped on a fan's foot the second time and sprained his ankle. And then the ankle fracture was just bad luck. He should be ready to go. He played massive minutes under Steve Clifford last season. I expect a very big season from the Mellow Ball, and I am definitely not shying away from him because he had an ankle problem last season. Miles Bridges will miss the first 10 games of the season due to a suspension. Not technically an injury, but an unavailability. So factor that in. I also don't know how that, I can't wait to talk to Doug from Locked on Hornets about this, how they're going to value Miles, because he's almost definitely not going to be there next season. But do they prioritize Gordon Haywood, who's almost definitely not going to be there next season either? Yeah, obviously they'll prioritize Brandon Miller, and we still don't know about the situation with PJ Washington. Is Bridges going to be a starter? Because he was significantly a better player than what Haywood was two years ago, but is the year out impact of that? Are the Hornets just not interested in him being a big part of what they do? I don't know. So the 10 game already hurts. Um, will he be in shape, out of shape? How does it all look? I still think he's draftable towards the uh, 90 to 100 sort of mark in a draft, and that could really pay off as a top 30 guy if it works out. But there's a lot of question marks there. Cody Martin played like two minutes in on opening night. The Hornets, with their worst injury reporting in the league last season, listed him doubtful for about a month. He came back. I think he played one more game. Then they listed him doubtful again, and then said he got surgery and then never updated anything. He had a nondescript knee injury all season, so basically a lost year for Cody Martin. Cody Martin's a guy that's never going to be a starter on this team, but it's just another 20-odd minute a night wing slash guard to add into the mix. Now, it doesn't seem like Kelly Oubre is going to return, but they're also adding Miles Bridges and Brandon Miller into that mix, and now Martin as well, just to further confuse things. And then the big fella also had an injury at the end of last season, a legit one. Oh, hi, Mark. He had a thumb issue. I thought he'd get surgery and they'd just shut him down. He actually returned and played a few games and then he was done. But then he did have surgery after the season. Not sure why they didn't do that earlier on. That should be no problems. But the fact that he did miss the end of last season with a thumb issue, he had uh, injury, had surgery, it's worth us mentioning. It's not going to impact the season moving forward. On to the Brooklyn Nets. The pimple, Derek Whitehead. Had a second foot surgery just before the NBA draft. Didn't play in Summer League. Had a foot issue all through last season with Duke as well. He's not going to be having a large role on this squad, especially as like a just-turned 19-year-old off his second foot surgery. They will be very, very cautious and easing him in. I really, really like Derek Whitehead and his upside long-term, but I don't think we're going to see much from him this season when you've, you're going to have um, yeah, Bridges starting, obviously. You're going to have uh, Cam Johnson. There's Finney Smith. There's O'Neal. There's Cam Thomas. There's Lonnie Walker. All those guys are involved. Whitehead will probably get some game time with Long Island. You might get a little bit for him for Brooklyn, but he's not going to be a factor. The other one is Dennis Smith, who had a bit of a toe injury at the end of last season. Don't expect there's any problem with that as we move forward, as he is likely the backup point guard. Well, it depends how they run things, because you know, Ben Simmons might be the starter, and Dinwiddie then gets backup point guard minutes. But Smith will get minutes in the teens, I would think, as an elite defensive guard. Obviously cannot shoot at all, and we're not drafting him anywhere. The Boston Celtics. Malcolm Brogdon, he was traded to the Clippers and then he wasn't because they got the medicals and went, oh no, oh no, 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 no. We're not doing that at all. And now Boston is sort of smoothing things over. It's like, oh no, actually we didn't really even want to trade you. Um, yeah, no, it was good, Malk. Um, Brogdon has been injured for a long time. Different injuries over many years. And we saw that elbow injury in the playoffs basically meant he couldn't shoot. They need him because they lost Marcus Smart. And he's going to be the sixth man again. But if he's hurt, then Peyton Pritchard has to step up. Because behind Peyton Pritchard, it's J.D. Davison. So Brogdon's injury, I, it's going to be really hard for me to consider him draftable. Even though he had a solid enough season last year, the fact that his upside is limited by the fact that he's a reserve, he's older, he gets injured a lot, so the minutes are going to be suppressed. And if he's entering the season injured which I don't know yet how long he's going to be out, if he's out at all. It's going to be really hard to get excited, even without Smart there. And the last team we look at here in the Eastern Conference is the Atlanta Hawks, who had bit Krejci dealing with an ankle problem. Does Krejci even make the final roster? 
I don't know. They've got one too many players, so he may or may not, but it doesn't really matter for really any fantasy league. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you are here on YouTube, thumb it up and leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.